Hello oh, and welcome back. We're talking about section 5.3 today, the definite integral and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, in the previous video, we tackled this uh, show how the area under a curve can be expressed as the limit. And now we're going to try to take care of this second objective, define the definite integral and explore its properties. So let me get where we're supposed to be here. All right. So the word integral ought to sound kind of familiar to you at this point in the course because we've used this, uh, this word for the indefinite integral. So the definite integral sounds like it should be something similar. And if so, then that, that's correct. Um, <laughs> like most of these definitions, I know that at first glance, this can be kind of overwhelming. There's just too much stuff going on here. But uh, let's see if we can briefly break this down. And then like most of them, they start to make a little bit more sense once we actually tackle some examples. So kind of our standard thing is to assume that f is continuous. We've got some interval we're working on. Um, and a lot of this language should be familiar from, well, familiar may be a strong word, but it should uh, remind us of the area under a curve definition that we had at the end of the, the previous video. So this limit in here that has to do with how many rectangles we've used is the same limit that, that occurs, the same terms that occur inside of uh, this definition. So the Riemann sum is basically just the areas of the rectangles. And we're, we're really saying uh, that precisely that the thing we came up with here, uh, this is the exact expression that we had from just a minute ago, and this is the area under the curve. Um, so we're making some caveats essentially that the function stays above the x-axis so that f of x is never negative um, but yeah so let's let's we'll, we'll dissect this a little bit more later on it really is worth thinking of this as saying here's the area of a curve and this expression on the left side is our tidier way of expressing this this is this is uh, when we write this little integral symbol with numbers on top and bottom what we mean is the area under a curve and we could express this as a limit of the number of rectangles uh, that we that we use to approximate its area because eventually we would actually with infinitely many rectangles come up with the the true exact area so this integral symbol should be familiar to you from the anti-differentiation stuff from earlier in the chapter um, the only difference is now we've got these a and b things these are called respectively the lower and upper limits of integration so um, it Basically, we're just we're, we're putting some numbers on here because it actually matters what interval of uh, x values we're concerned with. So not only do we need to know the function, but we need to know the, um, the, the x values we're operating with as well. So our, uh, our lower limit is this a value thing, and our upper limit is this b guy up top. And then just like with the indefinite integral, f of x is the function we're concerned with and dx reminds us or informs us of what the input variable is. So there's a bunch of uh, emboldened terms here because that's how we show uh, how we show definitions in the text, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll use these throughout and try to get a little more comfort with them. So just sort of codifying this notion as this new guy, the definite integral, actually being an area under a curve, we can kind of visualize this and say, look, here's Re, some region under a curve, we, we cut off the edges and say, look, we only want to go between A and B, some fixed real numbers. We want to look underneath whatever that curve is. The area of R, this, this value A, really is that definite integral. So we're using this, this uh, thing that in, sounds like it has to do with the antiderivative as a way to express an area, which is kind of intriguing because at least to me, my first exposure to this, it, it wasn't natural to assume that the antiderivative had some kind of connection to area. So for the time being, we're going to draw upon our connection between this so-called Riemann sum. Remember, that's just the, the sum of these uh, rectangular areas. The connection between that Riemann sum and uh, the notion of area under a curve. So we've got this uh, complicated looking function here, right? The area between this complicated thing, the x-axis, and on this interval, negative 2 to 1. And we're going to do this as a definite integral. So that will just be us writing something, not actually coming up with a number. And then we'll approximate that area with a Riemann sum. And we have to pick a number, so we're going to go with eight subdivisions. In other words, eight rectangles will approximate this area. Okay, so just using the definition of definite integral, we've got our 
x values on the lower and upper limits of integration. So the, the first x value we start at is negative 2. We go up to negative 1. Here is our f of x function. So this is just f of x back again. And like most of these, dx, because it's a reminder that x is our input variable. Um, so that differential is, is part of the visual appeal there. It's aesthetic is to tell us what, what's going on with the variable. Um, okay, so we're told that we need to find a Riemann sum, and that's going to approximate the area. And since the area is in the definite integral, it's going to be an approximate value of this definite integral, too. We've got n equals 8, so we can use that handy formula for delta x to say uh, the top of our interval was 1, the bottom was negative 2. Careful about your subtracting negatives here. Um, but that should give us not a super round number, but yeah, I guess that's life. Delta x is 3 eighths. So each of our rectangles, again, if we're trying to picture this, uh, would have a width of 3 eighths of a unit. So then our Riemann sum looks like area and this approximate is really important because we really are not sure exactly what this area uh, uh, is. We're approximating it. But it looks like uh, starting with the far left side. So this is A. So there's the, the first x value on the interval that we're concerned with. And this is supposed to be just uh, delta x above that, basically. So uh, here is a, so in other words, negative 2 plus this 3 eighths thing. Because remember, if the rectangle is 3 eighths of, uh, across, the next one would start 3 eighths above the previous one. So if this, one, this rectangle starts at negative 2, the next one's going to start 3 eighths of a unit above that, and so on. 3 eighths of a unit higher than that, 3 eighths of a unit higher than that. Didn't show them all because it's hard to squeeze in eight rectangles here, but there are, there are let's see, there's four showing. So here are uh, four sort of hidden rectangles. Uh, computations here, but they keep going up by 3 eighths of a unit until we finally get to the eighth uh, rectangle. And keep in mind, this is not B. That's, that's one of the hardest things to, to work with. B would be the far right side of this interval. Um, and this is not B. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is by the time we get to the eighth rectangle, we aren't actually using the far right side of the, of the, um, the graph. We're using just one delta x, just a smidgen to the left of it, and what we'll see on a picture here too, um, that what, uh, what we've got like back with our parabola example from, from uh, example one, that we didn't actually use the far right side to compute that. We used um, basically the uh, delta x short of b. We did the, the exactly one rectangle width short of the right endpoint. Anyway, this, this becomes a little bit better as we practice it some, but Here's where that whole mess looks like. Again, remember that, that 3 eighths is uh, this value. And so we plug that in for delta x. And so there's our 0.375. That's just a decimal version of 3 eighths. All these things look like what you get when you take negative 2 and you plug it in for f of x. Um, so or plug it in for all the x values in our formula for f of x. So in go each of those eight values and out comes an approximate and of about negative point uh, six seven six. Okay, so this definite integral is the exact area. What we've come up with it is an approximate value for that. So all of that three eighths times all those things added together gets us negative point six seven six. One thing to think about, and I'll ask the question, and then you can certainly pause if you want to think about it before getting an answer. Why is this number negative? What does it mean to have a, quote, negative area? Um, so if you have paused and are coming back now, <laughs> that's fine, or if you just listen to my awkward silence. Uh, negative in this case just means that part of the function drops below the x-axis. There's a piece of it where the function outputs are negative, and if I go back and look at these, you might notice these ones, uh, these first values that we look at are all negative, in fact. Negative 2 times e to the something, that's guaranteed to be a negative number. e to the whatever is always going to be positive. So this is negative, that's negative, that's negative. That's because the graph of this function actually starts below the x-axis. So we need to be careful when we use the word area, because area is generally a, a non-negative quantity. But this is like a signed area, an area that actually keeps track of whether we're below or above the x-axis. That might feel like a weakness, but actually it's, it's not when we think about applications in particular. Uh, if this was a, a profit stream, 
you would care if profit was negative for some portion of the time your your business was um, was operating. So that negative profit would weigh against whatever future profit you came up with. So it would be important to both have that negative and positive value contribute to your overall um, valuation. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with is an example for you to try out. Um, the goal would be to take uh, this curve, y equals x cubed, use the Riemann sum. Remember, just that's just the sum of these rectangular uh, regions, the areas of these rectangular regions. Um, and this is relatively nice because it's only two subdivisions. Uh, if you want to try that out, I encourage you to do that. Pause the video um, and then I'll quickly give you a solution. So uh, hopefully you took advantage of pausing and, and uh, we can quickly structure this. So a Riemann sum looks like uh, the sum of, we'll start with the, the left side here. So we've got f of 1 and we're going to add to that. Well, let's see, we've got two subdivisions. So I can jump in here and I get super excited about it, but I guess I need to figure out what delta x is um, before we explicitly even write it in the formula because we need to know how much to go up by, how much to, to bump our values as we move to the right. So uh, the b and the a in this case are respectively 5 and 1. N is the number of subdivisions or number of rectangles. So we get a relatively tidy 4 over 2, which is just 2. OK, what that means is uh, I'm supposed to jump up by 2 units. So in order to compute the next uh, value, I'm supposed to use f of 3, because that's 2 units higher. And then I'm tempted to do f of 5 as well. But remember, I've already got two rectangles. The first one is using the left side, the, the first endpoint to compute. And the second one is using two units above. That's it for rectangles. These are the two heights. And then the only thing that's missing is the delta x, which we already figured out is just two. So again, uh, and actually, so if you, if you read other math books, you may run into a left Riemann sum versus a right Riemann sum. This book uh, just defaults to using a left Riemann sum. It doesn't even call it that. But the left is implying you're starting with the left side of this interval. One is the, the very left side of this. And then you're going up until you have accounted for all of your rectangles. Um, so, ooh, oh no, I lost it. Um, so then our last computation that we would run there would be that we would get uh, f of 1, which is 1 cubed. We would get f of 3, which is 3 cubed. All of that gets doubled because that was our delta x thing. And then ultimately we're going to get 56. And you know we don't. This wasn't an actual applied problem, so we don't really have units. But if we had some units on our x and y, and assuming they were the same, these would be units squared when all is said and done. So that's it for this one. We will come back and start talking about the the behemoth of this section, the fundamental theorem of calculus.